session, final session of the conference. Hope we leave you with a good impression. I'm Stephen Carlini. I'm with Schneider Electric. We're going to talk today about IoT's impact on the data center, especially on data centers on the edge. There's been a lot of great talk about the applications for IoT, the autonomous cars, smart cities. Did everybody see the uh, Smart agriculture, where they put the sensors on the cow's tail, and you could tell when it was pregnant, when it was going to deliver the baby. Doesn't matter. That was that was something we didn't think we'd ever see. But there's things like that. One of my favorite applications, you know, is, is in the vineyard. So a lot of lot of IoT interesting applications. We're going to talk about how data centers are going to support a lot of those applications. We're going to start. We're going to start with cloud computing. When cloud computing came out, there was a lot of discussion about well, what is this cloud computing? How is it going to be used? Where is it going to be used? How do we define it? I was on a panel one time, I think about 10 years ago, and we were discussing, you know, how do we define this and what is it? Basically, it's, a, it's an architecture that has centralized, large centralized computing environments that process and store a tremendous amount of data. And everyone thought that was it. And John Chambers even came out from Cisco and said the world was actually only going to have one data center, one giant data center to serve the entire world. That, of course, didn't happen, and we actually see it going the other way. Um, the centralized cloud, it was conceived really for these applications, really for email. These are, these are applications that are not time sensitive, you can send an email, it doesn't matter if it's sent right away, whether it's received right away, it could take a few minutes, it's not the end of the world. Payroll, payroll is interesting in the cloud computing because you can disaggregate the payroll system from a lot of your other internal operations and it could be a standalone operation that you can run in the cloud without affecting any of your other business systems. And of course, Social media, and social media was the big catalyst in driving the, the build out of, of cloud computing architecture. So these applications, they are standalone applications. Uh, even social media when it started was you know, primarily you know, posting some pictures, communication, chat rooms, things like that. What we've gone into is something completely different. So a lot of applications have emerged. The first one is gaming. Gaming is the one, the one market that's single-handedly keeping the, the personal computer, desktop computer market alive. Nobody is playing games over wireless networks. They're all hardwired in. They're all using the latest and fastest personal computers. Tremendous amount of money is being spent on online gaming and making sure that uh, none of the gamers have a specific advantage uh, due to latency. So when you're playing against other people, you're shooting at other people, you're shooting at targets, it's very, very critical that everyone's on a, a similar playing field. Gaming, a lot of people don't know, but is so popular, it was the number two watched uh, TV program last year after the Super Bowl. So people are actually watching, tuning in and watching people play games online. And if you think about it, they're charging, what, $2 million, $2 million uh, for a 30-second spot in commercials. Gaming, gaming is actually huge. And it's actually driving a lot of the content delivery in, in, the, uh, in the network today. Autonomous cars, not going to talk a lot about. We've, we've talked a lot about it at the conference already. There's things that are emerging that are called C2C, C2I. These are new terms that, that, are, that are popping up that you probably haven't heard of. Uh, that's car-to-car -car communication. The other one is car infrastructure communication. So car-to-car -car communication is, is very important. Right now, when four cars come to a four-way stop 
intersection and they all stop at exactly the same time, what happens? Nothing. Nothing. They're, they're all programmed to let whoever, whoever stopped first go. So they all will actually sit there. So the C to C, the C to I, this, all this communication is going to become uh, very important. Uh, the medical, uh, the operating arena, the, the presenter before actually had a virtual reality in medical. That's another application. We're seeing a lot of life critical type applications that they want to run off a of cloud computing architecture, but they really need uh, higher availability and lower latency. So, centralized cl cloud architecture does have latency. Latency is caused by not, not the, not the uh, actual long haul networks and the bandwidth. There's plenty, of, there's plenty of bandwidth. What happens is as the data is sent from where it emanates to the cloud computing uh, uh, location, it has to go through switches, network switches. So these are called hops. So they have to go through east-west, which are hops that are along the way of the network. And then once they get to the data center, they go through north-south uh, hops. So each one of these switches will cause latency within within the data center. Uh, the service providers will say there's plenty of bandwidth. There's, there's, there's also this thing called dark fiber, which is fiber that they laid that they haven't lit up yet or turned on that's available. But they still, unless it's a direct connection, are going to have latency. And then you have regulations. Regulations are also limiting uh, the ability of having you know, these single large data centers. Um, data sovereignty is a big one, especially in Europe. Uh, that, that's causing a barrier to having just one centralized cloud. Everybody knows there's lots of drivers, lots of users, lots of devices, lots of data being created. But we have to focus on, you know, what, what IoT uh, devices, um, connected devices are going to cause a change in data center architecture. The smart shoes that, that, that are used to transmit data, like during a marathon, there may be a tremendous amount of runners, there may be a tremendous amount of, of data coming from these shoes, but it's not enough data to cause any kind of network connection uh, latency. It's just small data. What does cause a lot of latency is video. Video is, is the culprit that slows everything down. Any kind of high bandwidth content. Uh, 16, 17 years ago, they broadcast as the first live event over the internet, and it was a Victoria's Secret uh, uh, show. And not only crashed the Victoria's Secret site, it crashed the entire internet. So it, it came down. They had, another, they had another occurrence last year, the same kind of thing, that there was such a tremendous amount of, of people coming to their, to their show that it actually crashed their site. Um, things that slow down, if you have... If you have cloud services, if you have Microsoft 365 that rolled out uh, earlier this year or beginning of last year, when the Adele album came out a few months ago, there was a tremendous amount of, of, of uproar through Microsoft that they couldn't get to their online applications for, for almost a day and a half because this album was only available for, for, for download. People couldn't get to their online cloud services. So there is plenty of bandwidth. The bandwidth is there, but it's it's designed more, um, you know, for a average use rate, not these peak use rates. So when these peak use rates come out, it really causes uh, delays. So the answer, of course, is moving the data processing and content delivery closer to the users and closer to the data. So on-premise applications, you have retail. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of augmented reality, virtual reality, all, all kinds of smart applications that are going into retail environments. So you're seeing a lot of what we call edge computing uh, moving into those applications. IoT aggregation and control, also big, setting up these IoT networks very close to the user, and then content delivery of the high bandwidth content. So it's simple physics. It's moving the processing and content delivery closer. So, and we're seeing this. We're seeing Microsoft Dropbox. You can't talk about this without talking about Netflix, who abandoned all of their 
all their own data centers and moved all their content distribution to, to local uh, service providers, uh, primarily Amazon. So when you talk about cloud computing and the architecture, uh, I came across this. Schneider Electric is a, is a French company. And one of my French colleagues, we were having dinner one night, and he was saying that there was, there was a government program that was sponsored where they were spending a lot of money to have uh, the French language as the international business language, and they were spending a lot of money on this. So I decided, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. They, they probably should have given up on this a few years ago. So I looked it up, but I came across this, this Katru circle of uh, English language. So what, what this says is pretty interesting. So you have a couple of countries, like the US and the UK, that control kind of all of the norms and kind of all of the rules for, um, for, for the English language, which is you know, the international business language. Then you have countries that are in the norm developing or the, or the central circle that are really interested in playing in the, in the world with politics and business. So they're teaching um, English as a second language. And then you have the other countries which are norm dependent, which are teaching the uh, English language only to their business leaders and political leaders. So I said, this is very, very similar to how uh, cloud data centers with edge computing works today. So you have the centralized cloud, you have the big players like, like Amazon, like Google, uh, like, like IBM uh, that, and Microsoft that are developing these norms. And what they're doing is they're moving the data closer to the end users in regional data centers. And then you're going to see a wave of these localized data centers that are going to be possible because all of the same types of cloud stacks and functionalities are going to be replicated closer to the users. And then we have the localized devices that are running the applications uh, for IoT. So I thought it was interesting. This, this whole idea of this three concentric circles is very, very relevant in how, in how cloud computing is de being deployed today. So why can't Microsoft, why can't Google, uh, why can't Amazon just, just, just build more data centers closer to the users? And the answer is they can't build these fast enough. It's not, the, it's not technically uh, an issue, but there's issues with, with codes, with permitting. How do, how do they get... Um, the data closer to the users in these hyperscales, how do they move and replicate the cloud computing functionality closer? Uh, the answer is they're going into co-location facilities. A lot of these co-location facilities uh, were constructed in urban areas which are closer to the people. So you're seeing a migration similar to an airline where it's a, where it's a hub and spoke where they have their main centralized data center which are usually built in remote areas of the world, and they're moving those, and they're having a hub and spoke closer to where the actual people are. So they're doing this because they want their customers to be happy with their cloud services, and as the new IoT uh, devices become online and more smart cities come into play and more cloud applications uh, are rolled out, that the customers have a better experience. So Microsoft's cloud infrastructure, they have a hundred of these regional age data centers where they moved into service provider or co-location facilities, mainly to host uh, Microsoft 365. When Microsoft 365 came out, it was only hosted out of three data centers globally. Now it's in uh, more than a hundred data centers. And Google, maybe for, for content dis distribution, has, has over uh, 70 of these regional data centers in 33 countries. So what does Schneider do to help? We have different solutions to, to enable these cloud services. We have configure to order solutions. And then we have prefabricated solutions that we could, that we could roll out very quickly and easily and drop in place. So I had to show, had to show this slide being in Barcelona. 
uh, this is Sagrada Familia. Sagrada Familia is a great example of a, a customer that actually had a couple of issues they were trying to solve. They had cloud control, they had security. They, they wanted to up their level of security, and they also had a tremendous amount of, of engineering data that they needed to access on a regular basis. So this, this, this church has been under construction now for, I think, 150 years, or 20 or 25 years to go. It's being completely funded by, by, the, by the tourism at this point. So they deployed actually two 25-foot micro data centers. <clears throat> Each one of them were prefabricated here in Barcelona and dropped in, in place in two separate locations. As the construction actually progresses too, these data centers can be moved around uh, with, within the church. So each one of them has 10 racks. They're, they're sized for four kilowatts a rack. Uh, they have cooling. They're, they're complete uh, turnkey physical infrastructure solutions that were, that were dropped in place here. We also have a solution called infrastructure. And infrastructure is a configure to order using automated tools to put solutions together to support these regional data centers, power racks, cooling, security, software, and services. So this is, one, this is an example of a company called Internap. Internap is a co-location facility. And they were building their data centers in urban areas. And they even took it a step forward this year. And they actually built a data center in downtown Atlanta for the sole reason to reduce latency for the headquarters of the companies that were based there. So this is almost 100% uh, Schneider facility all the way from the switchgear down to the IT racks, the UPSs. So uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of these, the service providers you know, were, were very interested in moving closer, but Internap actually moved extremely close uh, to these headquarters and they're being very, very successful. I think they sold out in a very short period of time. Another, another company with an interesting business model is called, called DartPoints. And DartPoints will actually build a regional data center wherever you are. They will, they will drop one in place on premise at your site. They will drop it in a building that's close to your building, or they'll host it anywhere that you tell them you want it hosted. So this business model is, is, is emerging in co-location uh, with the idea that you, as cloud services become more and more critical to your business, that you have those closer uh, to your actual people using those services. So single racks, these are going to be like the backbone of micro data centers. Uh, we're showing one here at the show. So there's different versions of, of single rack micro data centers that we have. Um, a, a data center of significant processing and storage used to need to be 10, 15 racks. Now you can, with hyperconverged systems, do a tremendous, and flash storage, a tremendous amount of processing in a half rack or, or a single rack. So very, very powerful uh, data centers in, in single racks that are fast to deploy and are very, very versatile for different applications. We have them that we can drop into a server room type of environment or, or an office type of environment that are soundproof. And then we have ruggedized versions that, that you could use. The ruggedized versions uh, are very, very um, important for like financial institutions and things like that. So where are these localized data centers on the edge going? Where are they, where are they, where are they being deployed? How are they being used? <clears throat> We're seeing right now four primary uh, applications. We're seeing remote and branch office, network closets, server rooms, and, and industrial sites. This is one, if you can see where it is in Alaska, if you happen to remember the TV show Northern Exposure, it was about a doctor who had a lot of medical bills and to pay the medical bills, he had to go to a remote area that was only accessible by plane and had no, no highways to it at all. This is the same, same uh, application for this data center. Impossible to get to uh, 
by car. You have to fly in. So they built their, they built their data centers uh, using micro data centers. They strung a couple of micro data centers together and flew them in. So this is, when you think of edge, this is what a lot of people think of. Obviously, there are not too many of these types of applications, but here's, here's one that, that you could reference. This is what we're seeing as, as uh, a very, very, very um, significant trend in retail. This is a U.S. sporting goods company. Uh, most of these, most of these uh, uh, retail accounts, they have, they have wiring closets or network closets, and they usually aren't very secure, and they're usually uh, very unorganized. Um, what you're seeing when they start adding augmented reality, virtual reality, and advanced kind of uh, applications to, to these retail stores is they add servers. Once you add servers <coughs> and, and IoT networks feeding those servers, that has lots of customer data, there's a need to make these more and more secure. So we're seeing uh, edge applications to, to, to power these, and they're being secured in micro data centers like this that are being cleaned up and secure. The number one, the number one um, um, buying trigger for or these types of accounts is, is security, and physical security is a big part of that. Another interesting one is, is Formula One. Uh, whenever there's a Formula One race, there's an IoT network that's, that's set up in the Formula One race. The, the Formula One circuit um, saw a rise in some of the smaller teams about 10 years ago, mainly the Red Bull teams, uh, started to become very, very competitive with the bigger teams, the Ferrari, the, the Mercedes teams. And they, they really couldn't figure out figure out why all of a sudden these, these teams have emerged and it was because they were bringing um, uh, data centers to, to, the, to the track with them. So they're bringing the data centers. These cars have a tremendous amount of metering. Um, some of the cars have 500 sensors. Some of them have a, on less, maybe 250. Some of these sensors report every second. Some of these sensors report a thousand times a second. So there's a tremendous amount of data uh, that you could use. It's all one-way data. It's all coming from the car. Uh, but what, what Formula One had to do is they had to start limiting, had to start limiting the amount of computing power you could bring to the track. So right now, you could bring five servers. You could have um, um, 50 virtual servers running on those five servers. And you could have uh, 40 terabytes of data storage. So this is actually the micro data center at the track that's taking the sensors from the IoT network at the race, and you could have a certain amount of people. You could also have you know, data that you don't need real time back at, at headquarters. So this is an example. We're seeing things like this pop up a lot wherever there's a, a high degree of censoring, a lot of information, these, these IoT networks are, are becoming critical. And based on the data that these cars are, are generating, the Ferrari team says that after the first lap and a half, they can accurately predict where the car is going to finish in the race. So it measures things like you know, tire temperature, tire wear, fuel, you know, every, everything that, that you could possibly uh, imagine. Some of the information is actually public, like speeds and lap times, but a lot of it is, is, is used for them uh, to be able to tweak the car. They also limit the, the number of time that these cars are on the track. So you only have a couple of practice sessions and then you have the actual race. So the data that you get during those practice sessions is, is, is critical to be, being able to be competitive. Here's an example, and here's an example of where we think the micro data center market is going, which is a completely integrated stack that includes the power, includes the cooling, but it also includes the IT equipment, it also includes the application, everything in a turnkey type of, of enclosure. So the idea with these is that the firewall, the router, the switch, it's this one is being used for oil and gas. Each 
I think 20 miles of this pipeline you know, has one of these uh, micro data centers and, th and they're measuring things like flow rate, temperature, leak detection. Uh, they're, they're able to log in real time to see all of this information or also have it report back. So all of this is being staged. It's being staged and tested in, in an integration facility and then it's being dropped at every 20 mile intervals on the pipeline. So we think this is going to be a very significant trend uh, in data centers that you're going to be able to pick your applications and as you pick your applications you will pick the computing environment that will be a current turnkey drop in place solution. Another thing that's th that you're going to see is the redundancy or duplication of the cloud stack on premise. <clears throat> so we talked about the large centralized cloud data centers they're moving the functionality of those stacks to, to regional data centers. The next step is to move those regional stacks all the way to the on-premise, to your facility. So you will have, with application portability, uh, the, uh, the ability to run your applications locally with the lowest amount of latency. And then if you, if you want or if you lose communication or something happens, you can have backups in regional data centers and backups in cloud data centers. Or you can choose to run the cloud data center as your primary and use the one locally on backup. But this idea with application portability and these duplicating of these, the cloud stacks is, is going to drive a cloud computing architecture that I talked about with large centralized data centers, regional data centers, then on-premise data centers all running the same application. <laughs> So this is what we launched uh, last June, a portfolio of, of the micro data centers um, from traditional IT rooms to ruggedized to, to outdoor ruggedized uh, up to 10 racks. And we have uh, the configure to order and then the, the prefabricated ones that are used to reduce latency, um, um, increase security, and uh, increase your availability at the sites. So I want to change gears a little bit. You've heard about the edge data centers. I want to talk about uh, what we're calling Structure On. And Structure On is our cloud-based uh, data gathering and analytics platform that we're using for data centers. So this is our, this was just announced in North America and it's going to take all of the data from the connected products that we have in the data center. So all of, anything that's in the data center all the way from the medium voltage switch gear all the way down to the receptacles in the IT room are connected and this information is being sent <coughs> to our edge control which is the localized software that aggregates and compiles all of the data and then it's being sent up to the cloud-based analytics platform. So Schneider makes a tremendous amount of the <coughs> uh, physical infrastructure in the data center from the breakers on, in, the, in the facility side, the air economizers on the facility side. The IT room in some of our data centers has hundreds of thousands of sensors. So hundreds of thousands of sensors sending the information. So data centers on their own are actually a big percentage of the IoT uh, metering that, that, that's out there right now. So lots of sensing, lots of data coming out. It's going up to edge control. Structure on is an application that will enable you uh, to pool the data in one location, collect all of the data from your data center, we can also collect all the data center uh, information from similar data centers. You pull that data together, you have a giant data pool. And when you have a bigger pool, the more data that you have, the more accurate your predictive analytics are going to be. So that's the thinking of Structure On. So it's very easy to deploy. It's very easy to start uh, getting benefits from the structure on application. And once you have the information, you will be able to resolve your issues faster. So structure on 
as, as an analytics platform can be linked to service dispatch to automate. So you can set up um, through, through, your, through your business processes that if you get certain alerts, it can, it can automatically trigger di service dispatch. So it's, it's an application that you can run on mobile devices to have it sent to wherever you need to have it sent to. You can monitor the information remotely and you can run analytics. Here's an example of what it looks like our mobile application. The mobile application is taking information from uh, all of the devices in the network and you have different screens that you can customize whatever way you want and you could also set thresholds and alerts uh, with, with, with structure on and then like I said you could, you could have those linked uh, to automated service dispatch. So if you see to the right, it says field service, field service representatives on. You could chat with those field services. You could chat with the colleagues on the duty. You could go right to Schneider support. Very, very interesting mobile application that's linked to the cloud-based services. So uh, remote monitoring, uh, we can monitor the alarms for you. You can monitor them yourselves. Like I said, you can chat through your smartphone. You could actually log all the inc inc incident tracking, and you have access to the product experts for, for resolution. So with, with the data centers, um, you may be receiving some kind of alerts, some kind of alarms. You may not know what those mean. The ability to have somebody to, to, to talk to at, at, on the other side to help you decide whether it's a critical event or you need to take action. Uh, is, is really helpful. So, analytics, of course, is this is the kind of the holy grail of, 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 of getting this data. Um, you, you not only have your, your incident status, but you have summaries. You have you have KPIs with the, like the UPS age, battery age, cooling performance. You could look at the battery. Um, you could you could have the it report to you, um, this is the battery age, the temperature, this is how many times it's discharged. Then it will, it will compare that with other similar devices that are on the network, and you could, just, you could really narrow it down as to exactly the, the optimal time that you, that you want to change those, those batteries for the uh, ultimate efficiency. It'll also give you recommendations on how to improve, it'll look at your data center, it'll benchmark your data center against other data centers, and it will tell you areas where you may have a lower performance than, than other people that at the same kind of data center. So data gathering in the Schneider Cloud, linking that to automated service dispatch, and more accurate predictive analytics are the main benefits for that. So that's what I had for you today. I hope it was good. I hope you leave the conference on a, on a good note. So we'll open up for questions. Yes? I can't hear you. The converged and hyper-converged devices within the days? The, the, the question is, what's the difference between converged and hyper-converged uh, uh, IT equipment in the data center or data centers in general? Oh, the package solutions from Sony? So the question is, this, are the solutions from Schneider different, whether it's a converged or a hyper-converged uh, uh, IT architecture? So. That's a good question. Uh, typically, the, the hyper-converged uh, deployments are, we're seeing most of those in a 2U, 4-node type of, of rack, so we're, we're, our, our form factor, so they're usually smaller. So the solutions for the hyper-converged, if it's going into, primary application is VDI, but it's starting to branch out. We're starting to see those uh, just being installed in existing IT infrastructure. But in the future, we see those as being deployed in standalone drop-in-place data centers. 
Uh, converged systems are usually four or five rack systems. So it's more of a configure to order type of solution that, that you, can, you can drop into our physical infrastructure. But there really isn't a difference between the power, the cooling, um, and the, the racks that those go into. They're all pretty much the same. Uh, the big difference is when you go into, you know, what's, you know, bare metal or type of OCP or things like that that have actually different form factors. Then the solutions change, the cooling uh, technology changes, some of the backup changes uh, goes from, goes from like big three-phase UPSs to lithium ion within the racks. So that's where you see an architectural change in our solutions, uh, but not with converged and hyper-converged. Anybody else? Yeah, another one. <laughs> Using what? Oh, my cool. He's getting the microphone. Oh. Hello, this is Mohammed Sohail from Dell Technologies, and I'm asking if uh, Schneider uh, has any plans in, um, in self-healing uh, data center based on IoT solutions? Yeah, so everybody heard that, so it's a, a self-healing data center. So self-healing is, is when you collect all the data and you use that data to, to actually turn something that's, that's starting to break and make it healthy again. So self-healing, uh, yes, but it's not going to be completely automated. A lot of the analytics that we run are for the combustible components of the data center. There are the things that, that will fail, which are usually capacitors, which are usually uh, batteries, and which are usually fans. So what we'll do with predictive analytics is understand exactly when that's going to happen, and the, and the algorithms will actually predict based on the data, your data and the data of other people, very, very closely, you know, when you should change that. So it's not that they're going to be self-healing, but it's, you're going to have a much, much more accurate idea of when things are going to fail and then take action to prevent that. Anybody else? All right. Well, I thank you for coming. Have a great day.